Hi, my name is Kate, and today I'm gonna to be talking about making the Bejeweled dress from Taylor Swift's music video. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the music video, um, Taylor basically, she wrote and directed the music video in addition to writing the song. Um, and the premise of the music video is that Cinderella is still with the stepmother and the stepsisters and the prince decides to hold a talent show for a wife. She learns burlesque with Dita Fontis, and at the end she decides, mm, no, I don't wanna marry you, but she keeps the castle. And there's a shot right at the end where she steps out on this balcony of this castle that she now owns, and she's in this gorgeous yellow Rococo style ball gown, and I immediately fell in love with it, and I, immediately loved the message and I knew this was the dress that I wanted to wear to the Taylor Swift concert I was attending in Atlanta. This was one of the most ambitious projects that I have ever done. I used poly satin from Hobby Lobby um, for the actual dress, but I also had to make all of the undergarments. I made a practice dress out of a different color before I even started on the dress that I was making for the concert. Um, I did not film making the undergarments, which was its own adventure in its entirety. And this is the only footage that I actually have from the process of making the undergarments. It was very difficult. I have not made a corset before and I don't know if I'll make a corset again, but I will say that with undergarments, they are extremely, extremely important because they affect the shape and the look of the outer garment. So without the right undergarments, your dress is not gonna look correct, especially with something like Rococo style ball gowns that rely so heavily on the cage or the hoop skirt or the panniers beneath the gown. I did really like making the panniers and they were not as difficult as I thought they would be. Um, and Simplicity had a very easy pattern to follow and I highly, highly recommend if you're going to make your own hoops to at least buy that pattern. I wanted to go ahead and include the footage of the practice gown that I made because I did learn from that process. I did speed it up. All of my sewing videos are time-lapsed, which I don't know how much that increases the speed of it. Um, and then my practice gown, I went ahead and I increased the time-lapse speed by five. So it's very, very quick. Um, and then I'll slow it down a little bit more to show you the process of actually sewing the yellow gown itself. Um, I will say the undergarments, I think took me about 20 hours. The practice dress, I probably spent about 15 hours doing. Um, I still have not adorned it. I have not done any decorations that are very like of the period of the style. I do plan on doing that at some point, just not soon because of how much decoration ended up going onto the yellow dress and I am tired of frills. And then the yellow dress itself, just the outer layer, um, it took about 30 hours. So all in all, this project I invested about 65 hours into. I started in January and I finished um, about two or three weeks ago. So it, I took about three and a half months and I spaced it out, did about three to four hours of sewing per day and did about two or three days of sewing per week. With a project as big as this, if you are not familiar with sewing or if you get tired, if you get achy, sore, hungry, honestly, any condition of the, the, the human existence, I would say break it up because this is a marathon, not a sprint, especially with a gown this size. Took about 14 yards of fabric. 14 yards of fabric. So 
If that gives you any idea of the pacing that is necessary to get this gown done, then good. <laughs> you need to have an idea for the pacing. Um, so now that I kind of set the scene, um, let's jump in. I missed the process of cutting out my white fabric, but it was pretty much similar to the cutting out of the yellow fabric, which will be later on in this video. The pattern begins with the construction of the gown with several details that I'll go further into once we get into the more detailed process of the yellow gown. In my opinion, one of the most complicated steps of this entire process is making the back pleats. And I felt like I really needed to slow down and prove to you that I got it right on the white dress. When I was making the yellow dress, that was one of the steps that I struggled with the most and it took me about three tries to get it right. Once the panels of the gown are sewn together, you construct the sleeves and sew those into the gown and then sew a bodice lining to give the dress a little bit more structure. At this point in the process, it will look a little bit like a paper sack until you get that bodice lining with the ribbons tied into the gown to basically make it an adjustable size. Here I am doing the lining of the sleeves. This is a mistake that I made the first time around is that I did not sew the lining of the sleeves to the lining of the bodice and I had to attach it afterwards and the seams did not look pretty. This pattern called for a contrast stomacher and petticoat, but I decided just to do it all in one color. So I combined the amount of fabric that I needed from the contrast fabric and the primary fabric in the pattern description. The final step of the lining is to sew the pleats in place. Make sure you don't accidentally sew over any of the fabric that you don't want included in the pleat. Once that lining is in there, you'll start making the stomacher sections. For those of you who don't know, like I didn't know, the stomacher is basically the center of the gown. The pattern calls for a two-piece stomacher that snaps in the middle. I did not like the look of the two-piece, so I ended up modifying it for the yellow gown, which we'll see next. Here is that gown on for the first time. I sewed the stomacher on too high and decided I didn't like it as a two-piece, but all in all, a good first try. As you can see by the watermark, my Instagram gets updates a lot sooner on these projects. Then it was time to start the yellow dress. Like I said earlier, I decided not to do a contrast piece for this gown since Taylor's gown was all in this one yellow color. Therefore, the cutting layout included in the pattern did not work for me, so I made it up as I went along. Luckily in my house, I have one big empty room full of hardwood floors, which makes it really easy to lay out the fabric, lay the pattern on top, and cut it. I mentioned I was working with about 14 yards of fabric, and here you can see why. The gown panels start as really long, wide panels, and to get the ruching details, you end up gathering a lot of the fabric during the sewing process. For all of these pieces, I used my pinking shears. Because I noticed so much fraying fabric when I made my practice gown out of the same fabric, just in a white color. In order to turn the stomacher into a one piece, I just cut that part of the pattern out as if it was centered on a fold. And it was time to head into the sewing room and begin. Like any good project, I started with some bobbin winding. Luckily, I was able to find a thread color that matched the gown almost exactly. So I decided to use both my top thread and bottom thread in that color. The pattern begins by telling you to stay stitch the waistline edge of both the front sections and the side back sections. One of my favorite things about Simplicity's patterns as a beginning sewer is that they include a glossary of sewing methods. So even though I had not done a stay stitch before, I was able to figure out what it meant from the glossary. Once both those sections have been stay stitched, you sew the two sections together and you do that twice, one for the right side of the gown and one for the left side of the gown. The next step is to narrow hem the side edges of your opening, which creates your pockets. Then you'll follow the pattern to make the pleats on the front of the waistline and the side back of the waistline. The easiest way for me to do this was to lay my fabric on top of the pattern, fold the fabric over itself to meet the line where the pleat was marked on the pattern and pin in place. I didn't wanna risk marking the pleats from the pattern onto the gown in case that it would show in my final product. I then pressed out the pleats and sewed them in place. Next, you'll pin the bodice front to the front and the side back at the waistline seam. 
Here it's really important to follow the guide that the pattern gives you to match the dots with each other because it will save you a lot of headache in difficult times to come. Press the bodice out, the seam towards the bodice, and then sew the edge of the bodice to the side edge of the side back. The number of times that I'm saying the word side does not make this less confusing. Finally, you'll be on the back panels of the gown. Stitch the center back of the back seams together and that will be the easy part. Once you've done that, you'll have to make the pleats towards the center back across the upper edge of the back. This is where I messed up. It's really important to note that you're only making two pleats at this step, the pleats that are moving towards the center of the gown. There are more pleats marked on the pattern, but you'll make those pleats later on in the sewing process. Remember when I said the bodice lining gives the gown some structure because besides that it will look like a blob? This is what I meant. Super fun to play with, not super reasonable to wear. Because I messed up the pleats during the yellow version of this gown, this will look like I'm doing things slightly out of order from the pattern. Here I am cutting out the bodice lining. For this fabric, I'm using a recycled old bed sheet since secondhand fabric is definitely cheaper than buying everything new. The lining is one of the things that I messed up on the practice version of the gown, so I took some extra time to consult my pattern before reinforcing the inner corners of my bodice back lining and attaching yellow ribbon to match the outside of the gown, which then will act as a way to give my gown some shape and structure when I'm wearing it. Then, because I learned from the mistakes I make, I cut out the lining for my sleeves and proceeded to attach them to the bodice lining before I sewed the lining into the gown. I narrow hemmed the back and lower edge of the bodice back lining to prevent any fraying while I was wearing the gown and to make everything look nice and finished. Here I am finishing up the edges of the sleeve in the same manner before trying on the bodice lining to make sure that everything fit before I sewed it into the inside of my gown. Everything seems to fit well, and once those ribbons are tied, it will give me some extra shape and structure while I'm inside the gown. Here I am making the sleeves to go onto the gown. I stitch the seam of both sleeves, gathering the upper edges of the sleeves between the notches. Once both sleeves have been made, I will hold the gown on the wrong side out with the armhole towards me, and putting the right sides of both the gown and the sleeve together, I'll pin the sleeve in the armhole and sew in place. Go ahead and do that on both sides of the gown, both the left and the right side, and then you'll be ready to put the lining into your gown. With the right sides together, pin the lining to the gown at the front and the neck edges. Remember that the right side of your lining will show you nice, clean edges. You will not be able to see your raw edges. When I was putting the lining into my gown is when I realized that I messed up on my pleats. As you can see here, the back of my gown was much wider than the back of my bodice lining, so I knew I had made a mistake somewhere, and I was just trying to figure out where. I swear I've made this dress before. In order to avoid making this mistake yourself, make sure to pay special attention to step eight, making the remaining pleats along the upper edge of the back and the side back. These are the remaining two pleats that fold away from the center seam. I mentioned this earlier when we were talking about step six, since you do not make all of the pleats in one step. I don't even know if that looks right. Does that fit? Eventually, I had to go back, unsew some seams, repin everything just to make sure that all the pleats were correctly made. Then I was able to sew the lining of the bodice in and everything fit exactly the way that it should have. I would not recommend making that mistake and taking my route as that probably added at least an additional hour onto my sewing time. Here I am trying on the gown with the fitted bodice for the first time. With the six rows of ribbon, it is more fitted. However, I ended up going back and adding one more ribbon in just because the waistline of the gown was not as tight as I wanted it to be. The reason that it's not closing in the front is because I don't yet have the stomacher, but that will be added later on in the sewing process. 
The next step in the process is to narrow hem the front and lower edges of the gown. One of my favorite machine accessories was this narrow hem foot. It speeds up the process, for me at least twice as fast, because I do not have to iron and press the narrow hem into place. The roll of the foot allows me to essentially fold the fabric into itself as I'm going. Once you have your narrow hem on the gown in place, you will also do this to the lower edges of the sleeves. Normally for step 18, you would stitch the seams in place. Instead, I decided to use my freehand embroidery foot to do something a little bit fun since this was for a Taylor Swift concert. I started on the periphery of the letters and then filled it in as I went, but I think this added little detail makes the back of the pleats so much fun. Now here we are at the stomacher. Like I have said several times before, the pattern will call for two pieces of the stomacher but for the look of this gown, I wanted one piece that fastened with snaps on either side of the gown. It is constructed in much the same way. With the right sides together, pin both sections together and stitch, leaving an opening long enough for you to turn it inside out. Once the stomacher is turned right side out, make sure that you sew it in place on one side of the gown. The other side will be fastened using snaps. Here I am trying on the gown with one side pinned in place, trying to get an idea for how high or low I want the stomacher to be placed on the gown. This step is very important, and this I realized when I was making my practice gown, because if you sew the stomacher too high, you'll be able to see the corset underneath your gown. For the most realistic and comprehensive idea of how the gown will fit, it would be best to try on the gown with the skirt and the hoops. However, at this point, I had not yet made the skirt. The reason that you've seen about three different times of me pinning and trying on the gown is because it did take about four or five different attempts of pinning the stomacher in place for me to finally like where it ended up on the gown. I sewed it in place on one side and on the other side, I am fastening snaps. One side of the snap will go on the front facing part of the stomacher. The other side of the snap will go on the back facing part of the gown. The decorations on the outside of the gown will hide the stitches of the fasteners on the side where you are sewing your snaps. This is me trying on the completed gown for the first time with the stomacher in place using snaps to fasten and it fits so well. I was so excited and I loved the extra little detail that I added on the back. Now that the gown was completed, it was time to begin on the petticoat. The first step is to stay stitch the waistline of the petticoat. In total, it is going to be four panels. The pattern calls these panels the center front and center back section and the side front and side back section. Once those are stay stitched, you'll pin the side front section to the front and stitch those together. Then comes the pleats. I did the same method of pleating as I did on the gown, using the pattern as my guide rather than transferring any markings to the fabric. One thing I didn't get to mention while I was making the practice gown is that the skirt did not sit at my waistline. The skirt size that I ended up using in the pattern was too big for me, even though my measurements measured into that size. I had forgotten this the first time around, so when I went to try on the skirt for the first time, it was a little less than successful. I ended up going through several stages of adding my own pleats, eventually just to take some of them back out. Essentially, I was just trying to make it so that the waistline of the skirt would rest at my natural waistline. To make sure that you wouldn't be able to see the corset between the gown and the skirt, I'm trying the two on together at the same time. Even though you're able to see the blue dress on the sides through the pockets, you won't be able to see the blue dress from the front of the gown. And that for me is the more important aspect of this. There are pocket holes in the top of the gown 
so you're able to access the pockets beneath the skirts if you needed to. Now the construction of the gown and the petticoat is done. The now difficult part of adding all of the decorations and flounces has begun. Next came the sleeve flounces. Now the pattern does come with its own template. However, I decided I wanted to do something different because I did not want the scalloped edges that the template used. I did use the template to create the general shape of the fabric that I ended up cutting out and I stitched that with the lace that was similar to the sleeve that I was trying to recreate. As a reminder, this is the sleeve that I'm going for. I began just by pinning the sleeve straight onto the gown, but I realized that doing this created more of a flat effect than the gown in the music video. So I went back to the drawing board and ended up gathering the edge of the entire sleeve with the lace included and before I pinned that back on the gown and tried it on again. Here are the two methods of pinning side by side. On the left side of the screen is the sleeve that I gathered and it looks much more like the one in the video. On the right side of the screen is the one that I pinned straight on and I immediately knew I was going to take it off and gather it up before finally sewing it on. Then it was time to figure out the ruffle details on the front of the gown. Again, the pattern had a template for this, but it had that scalloped edge. Instead, I decided just to use my pinking shares using the width that the pattern suggested and trying it on my own. I pulled up the photo of Taylor in the dress as a reference and tried to match that as much as possible. Since the only reference photo available was behind a balcony, it did make it very difficult to recreate the bottom half of this gown. One of the first difficulties I ran into was not really being able to tell what the color of the contrast lace was on those ruffles. I began by ordering a navy blue and trying it in between the large gathered fabric and a smaller piece of gathered fabric, but something about the color combination just didn't look quite right. While I waited for a new color of contrast lace to come in, I went ahead and used my freehand embroidery foot to secure the ruffles to the front of the gown. This was a long, detail-oriented, painstaking process that took way too long in my opinion. The other frustrating aspect of this was that even though I pinned all of the ruffles in place, the slickness of the poly satin caused the fabric to move while I was sewing it. The end result was that the ruffles on both sides of the gown were not perfectly lined up. However, because it was such a frustrating process to get to this point, I decided that it was good enough and I decided to leave the ruffles in place as they were slightly askew. The details on the stomacher are when I went completely off book. The reference picture from the music video was the only thing I had to go off of, so I decided to start by gathering about an inch of fabric on my sewing machine and pinning into place. I used the picture from the music video to decide how to lay out the gathered ruffle, trying as best as I could to follow the pattern that I saw in the music video. Then I gathered my newly acquired light gray contrast lace and did the same thing. Once I had pinned everything into place, I used my, you guessed it, freehand embroidery foot to sew everything onto the stomacher. And then I tried it on, which in hindsight was a risky bet, but I ended up loving how everything looked once it was all laid out. I also ordered a three inch version of the same light gray lace and tried layering that between the large ruffle that I had already sewn onto the gown and a one inch gathered version of that same yellow fabric. And I think it looks much more accurate to the music video. Before I tackled on finishing the skirt ruffles, I thought I would try my hand at the bows on the bodice. Now, earlier I said that there would be details that would cover up the stitches from the snaps, and I was specifically talking about the bows. On Taylor's dress, there are bows up and down both sides of the stomacher, and when I tried making bows out of this ribbon that I bought, I just did not like that it wasn't the same color as the gown itself. 
I ended up using my pinking shears to cut out one inch strips of fabric, tying bows and pinning them into place, which took a lot longer than if I had just been able to find a ribbon that matched the gown itself, but I was much happier with the end result. With detail work, I tend to jump around a lot, and I decided that while I was cutting out strips of one inch fabric for the bows, I would also cut out the one inch fabric that I needed to make the details on the front part of the petticoat. There was a lot of detail on Taylor's gown, but again, it was hard to see through the detail of the railing. So I ended up going for the general outline and gist of the shapes that she had on her petticoats, knowing that it was not going to be perfect in the end. I layered my yellow fabric on top of my contrast lace to help it pop against the back of the petticoat and then I ended up using my freehand embroidery foot to sew it in place. There were several times throughout the process that I needed to pause to gather more contrast lace and to gather more fabric, but in the end it all ended up working out. Here I'm trying on the petticoat for the first time quickly realizing that all the extra pleats that I made to make sure that this sat at my natural waist were actually blocking the pattern. I broke out the seam ripper and took out one set of the pleats so that the design would lay flat and people would be able to see for what it was. With the pleats, the skirt folded too much and even though I pinned it on flat, it wasn't going to read the same way that Taylor's dress did. As if all of that detail work didn't take enough time, I still had to secure all of those details to the gown. Like I said before, all of this detail work I secured to the gown using my freehand embroidery foot so that I was free to move the fabric around on the sewing surface rather than having to move in a straight line. To see how far I had come and to get some renewed vigor for the project, I decided to try on the petticoat and the gown with the hoops and wow was I impressed. It gave me enough energy to start the next step. Then it was time to finish the ruffles on the front of the skirt. I thought that it would be easier to gather the contrast lace and the top yellow ruffle together, and turns out I was right. I feel like I saved a lot of time gathering the two together. Then I pinned in place on top of the ruffle that I had previously sewn to the gown and used my freehand embroidery foot to secure the two right down the center. Like I said earlier in this video, all of my sewing is time-lapsed. And at times when I don't have as much to say, I will go ahead and increase that time-lapse just to make the video go even faster. Because I had already talked about gathering the fabric and pinning one side of the contrast lace to the ruffles, I thought about just deleting this part of the video, but I feel like part of these videos is to show how much work and time and effort and energy, blood, sweat, and tears go into a project behind the scenes. I know personally, if I don't sew another ruffle for about six months, I would be more than okay because this project took so much time, specifically on the detail work, which is still happening right now, even despite the time lapse. In fact, I got to a point in the detail work where I was so done with sewing, I decided to hot glue the bows into place. You can see out my window how dark it is, how late it is. I just really wanted to get to the point where I was done with this dress and I did not feel like hand sewing on a bunch of extra little details. Once the bows were in place, I tried on the entire dress with the hoop and it felt surreal to have gotten this far. This was a project that I was not sure that I was going to be able to do successfully. It was extremely ambitious. I've only been sewing for about a year and a half and I'm completely self-taught. I was definitely most intimidated by the amount of detail work and ruffles, but in the end, I feel like it looks extremely authentic to the dress that Taylor wore in the music video. I had so much fun wearing this to the concert and everybody was so nice and even Taylor got to see it. 10 out of 10 would recommend wearing a ball gown to any event that you can possibly wear one to. As Taylor said, take the moment and taste it.
And if you liked this video, don't forget to like and subscribe.